So good evening, everybody. It's great to have you with me today. There is a mystery concerning the exact arrival of the Jews in Britain. It is likely that a few Jews had set foot there before 1066, but there are no material remains to confirm this. When we turn to 1066, we are on firmer ground. But for us Brits, even though I call myself now an Israeli, 1066 is one of those dates that is incredibly important in English history. Let's put it like this. At the start of 1066, England was ruled by Harold Godwinson. By the end of the year, a Norman, William the Conqueror, an Ill illegitimate usurper to the throne, became king instead, having killed Harold Godwinson, who had just been named heir by the dying and childless King Edward the Confessor at the Battle of Hastings. The battle has a beautiful tapestry of this event called the Bio Tapestry. So an Anglo-Saxon king of England is replaced by a Norman king of France. William the Conqueror was Edward the Confessor's first cousin once removed. And ironically as well, 1066 is an important date for the Jews of England. 1066 is actually the first official date we have for Jews of Rouen coming to live in England. It is the beginning of the best documented national Jewish community in medieval Christendom. William the Conqueror, the new Norman king, comes to England and invites his Jews from his Norman possessions to settle in England. Not only was he the most important conqueror and usurper in English history, but he seems to have been the first medieval king who transports Jews with him to a new land. It is also ironic when you think that 244 years later, sorry, 224 years later, England is going to be the first country in Europe to expel its Jews as well. But more of that later. Let's turn to when Jews arrive. The Jews who came were of the upper class in northern France, what was known in contemporary rabbinical literature as Sarfat. Of course, the modern usage of Safat encompasses all of France, but Safat then referred to the very specific subgroup of Ashkenazic Jews concentrated west of the Shum Rhineland communities that we met in our first lecture, across Rouen, Champagne, Ile de France, Picardy, and Normandy. Here in England, these Jews are going to have a specific profession specializing almost from the outset and much more narrowly in the banking business. Unfortunately, this combination of banking business and growing royal control resulted in the potential for considerable royal explo exploitation of Jewish wealth, as we shall see. The Jews in in of England have this status that we have already talked about under Christian kings that they belong to the king, serfs of the royal chamber, servus regei camera. The barons, those nobles whose court surrounded the king, only rarely gain control of them. And as part of his efforts to secure England, William orders many castles, keeps and mots to be built, among them the central keep of the Tower of London, the White Tower. These fortifications allow Normans, their barons, as we will see, and their Jews, to run into them when they need to, when they are threatened. They also allowed garrisons to be protected while they occupied the countryside. The Jews needed the king's protection from the beginning, and so the Jews settled near the king's castles. These offered them forms of security, self-preservation, and social welfare. The Jews had their own royal representative or a powerful protector close at hand. And a good example 
of how useful these protectors were is when the Jews of Norwich was saved in 1144 after being accused of ritual murder. Now, William of Norwich was actually supposed to have been buried in the Norwich Cathedral. And having been there a few months ago, I was disappointed to actually not be able to find his remains. What I did find was this sort of small shrine, which is actually dedicated to him. But we know that he's buried somewhere underneath Norwich Cathedral. And it was King Stephen Castellan, Castellan in 1144 or royal representative, his name was John de Chesney, who with his, arms guard, with his armed guards delivered the Jews from their accusers in 1144. And when the Jews were supposed to face trial, Chesney removes them, protects them in his castle under guard, armed guard, as you see here in Norwich Castle. So where did the Jews settle in 1066? Well, the first place is obviously going to be London. But we have no precise numbers as yet as how many Jews. The scarcity of governmental records for the reigns of William I and his two sons, who become kings, that is William II and then Henry I, makes it rather hazardous to generalise with confidence on this important issue. But the early records of the royal exchequer the pipe rolls of the, 30, of the first 30 years of King Henry I do show evidence of, of a number of wealthy Jewish financiers. So what more can we say about Jews from the outset? Well, the Jews are a new people to the English. In their documents, they never really regard themselves as English, but rather as Anglo-Norman or as Ashkenaz. And I want you to sense this feeling of them being outsiders, more so than in Sicily, Sicily as we saw last week, where there were always other foreigners. Look at this image of Aaron of Colchester, a doodle that was done by a court clerk. And note the title he gives it, Aaron Phil Diaboli, Aaron the son of the devil. These Jews are outsiders, they're not particularly at home at this moment in England. And even today, though we think about the Jewish population, it's also very small, very much like the medieval population then. Now it is just over 1%, 260,000 Jews living in England. And it was this similar smallness, that is less than 1%, that rendered their presence in medieval England as exceptional. Nowhere else in Europe was there a Jewish community that was so small, so strikingly a group of immigrants and aliens, so completely dependent upon money lending as the Jews of England become? I would even add, so astonishingly successful at it too. Jewish business technique and acumen brought economic advancement to England. The Jews really helped to foster a revolution in the provision of capital in medieval England. So ready, we have a few ideas of what we are going to see with our Jews in Angleterre. I intend to use our hour together to really look at this memorable medieval Jewish experience, which lasts from 1066 to 1290. Together, we will be concentrating on the Jews' daily life and culture, we're going to look particularly at the case study of Aaron of Lincoln, who is the most famous Jewish medieval financier. We're going to look together at examples of anti-Judaism here, and particularly the, um, the case of the York Massacre in 1190. And finally, together we'll look at the, at the Jews' expulsion in 1290. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at where Jews settled. It was many decades after 1066 that members of the London Jewry move out and began to settle in provincial towns. This is the time of Hen King Henry II in the mid-12th century. According to William Fitzstephen, Fitz one of the most famous biographers of the time, the ending of the anarchy of Stephen's reign and the accession of young Henry II in 1154 was a turning point in the history of Jewish economic activity in England. And this is what he says, peace was everywhere 
and there emerged in safety from towns and castles, both merchants seeking fares and Jews looking for creditors. Now we can begin to talk more confidently. And thanks to the survival of an in uninterrupted sequence of pipe rolls from the second years of Henry's reign, we know that by 1159, there were no less, as I say here, than 10 Jewish communities sufficiently established in English provincial towns. And here we list them. More Jews had arrived at the end of the 11th century from France, both from the Angevin and the Capetian territories. So we looked together, Norwich, Lincoln, Worcester, Cambridge, Thetford, Northampton, Bungay, Berry, Oxford, and Gloucester. All of these places figure in this, list, in this list. And many of these towns were ports, but not major ones. Most had mints and were located close to important fairs. And all of these towns had Norman castles offering protection to incoming Jews. An example where Erin of Lincoln was situated, Lincoln was an ideal place to settle and make profitable, profitable loans. And Aaron really sees this potential. William of Malmesbury, the foremost English chronicler of the 12th century, describes Lincoln as one of the most popular cities of England and a marketplace of men who came by land and sea. And by the late 12th century, the Norman Jews had settled in just over 38 different centers. Estimates of medieval population are notoriously unreliable, but they are somewhat less for England than for most other places. By the mid 13th century, England had a population of perhaps 5 million people. Of these, 3,000 to 5,000 were Jews, so we're talking about 0.25%. And we know that there were a lot of Jews, about 200 of them, living in Norwich by the 1130s. So one defining characteristic of our medieval Jews in England is that he or she is very much a town dweller. They must have integrated themselves into urban life and culture to a certain extent, although they were never part of the urban patriarchate. Most of them owned house properties, both to live in and to rent out. And these properties were next to those of Christians, a somewhat double-edged privilege. And the traditional idea that Jews in England had stone houses, whereas Christians could not afford stone houses, does have some basis. This Jewish world is dominated by these Jewish magnates who buy up land and rents, build stone houses and supply synagogues for their communities. Some of them had princely and spacious mansions and sometimes additional homes in different major centers. And we do have remains of their houses, as we can see. Now, Junet's house in Norwich was on King Street, now Wensum Lodge. He was one of the richest Jews in England at this time, and his house was owned by his son Isaac in 1194. We also have Moyes Hall in Bury St Edmunds, which we know was a Jewish home. We don't think now it was a synagogue, but interestingly enough now it is used as a, a local museum. And perhaps all these houses, I think, should remind us of the plutocratic palazzi in Renaissance Italy. Each Jewish community had a synagogue, with schools of different levels in which males studied Hebrew, the Bible, and Jewish law. Volumes of Talmud were owned by the synagogue as well as by some of the wealthier Jews. The center of communal life in the medieval times was the synagogue, but for the very small communities, a synagogue was often in a private house. Documentary evidence exists um, and tells us about 30 synagogues that have survived, 
but they were probably more in existence at various times. And most of these synagogues were situated in the center of a town. And here, if you look down on the right-hand side, you will see the term synagogue right next to various houses. You can see how small it is until it actually grows bigger and moves across into St. Olgate's, where you see, which is now um, in our modern times, is the Tom Tower. That is actually sort of the left-hand tower of the College of Christ, of the Christ, of Christ Church College. But it just really gives us us a sense of where the synagogue is and always that whole area of course was known as Great Jury Street um, in Oxford. In Lincoln the synagogue and Bet Midrash, the house of study, was situated in Jews Court on Steep Hill and the niche here in the wall has been identified as the original space where the, where the Ark, where the Holy Ark was situated, facing obviously in the right direction towards Jerusalem. Below this floor of where the synagogue is now, and this song is actually used by the community in Lincoln today as their synagogue, we know that a medieval mikveh existed, but unfortunately when I went down to the bottom, there is very, very little to see. So this is where the former synagogue was situated in Norwich on a site between the four, this is actually sort of in showing you Norwich here, this is where the, the former synagogue was situated in Norwich, on a site between the former Star Inn and Lamb's Inn, clearly set back from public view inside an alley. So you have to go and really look for it. If you go to the Lamb's Inn in Norwich, you'll know that you're standing on the site of the medieval synagogue. And the synagogue building in the medieval times offered accommodation for travellers and courtyards were used for weddings. And interestingly enough, another mikveh has been unearthed in London in the parish of St Mary Magdalene, one of the parishes, one of the nine parishes where Jews lived in London. It is now being removed and put inside the Jewish Museum of London. We think it was probably built in the 13th century in a house occupied by Moses Crespin, but we're not sure if it was a private or a public one. And we also have some extant examples of Jewish material culture during this period. The most famous one is the Bodleian Ewa, um, uh, was found, we think, we, it was used in the mid-13th century, it was found in Suffolk in 1698, probably was a sort of a washing utensil for washing the dead, and it bears this Hebrew inscription showing that it had been presented by Joseph, son of the martyred Rabbi Yechiel. Um, we also have a, an extant shofar that you can see on a visit to a British museum, to the, to the British Museum, um, definitely a remainder of the life of the, from the life of the Jews during this period. But in terms of learning, these Jewish communities were less creative than their contemporaries in northern France in the 11th, 12th and early 13th century. And the pressures of Jewish life need to be given, I think, as a reason for this. As we always argue, you can only be creative or artistic as a people if you are able to live comfortably. What we do know is that Jewish scholars in England were in close contact with their counterparts in France. And we have some interesting halachic legal sources that remain from medieval England. The first is the legal responsa and Mishnah commentary of Rabbi Elijah Menachem of London in the 13th century. We have Sefer Etz Chaim, a book of the tree of life by Yaakov or Jacob ben Bar Judah Chazan of London. This was written in 1287. It's a collection of Jewish law that made available the rabbinical opinions of scholars such as Rabbi Elijah of Warwick and, Joseph, and Rabbi Joseph of Bristol and Rabbi Moses Moshe of Dover. We also have, as you see here in the Bibli Bibliotheca Palatina, a Palmer document, a manuscript with commentaries to various Talmudic tractates, and this was known as Tosafot Hachame Anglia, the, edition, the additional commentaries of the English sages. 
We ha also have the writings of Moses of London, who died in 1268. He wrote the Darke Hanigud of Hanagina, which was an important work on Hebrew punctuation and accentuation. And we also have the poems of Meir of Norwich. He was a liturgical poet and Chazan, which have survived and bear witness to the events leading to the expulsion, the massacres, imprisonments, and that happened uh, towards the end of the presence of Jews in England. We also know that the Jews of England hosted Abraham, Meir Ibn Ezra, the poet, the astrologer, biblical commentator, grammarian, and essayist during his wanderings from Spain. And he toured and studied in England for three years from 1158 to 1161. But what about how the communities are run? Well, Jewish communities had their own Beth Din or Capitulum Judeorum, as it was called in Latin, which was composed of three appointed officials from the congregation who were responsible for arbitrating over dowry rights, marriage settlements, the appointment of guardians for minors and land and contract disputes. And these were temporary appointments made among the most influential members of the community. And it's quite interesting as well because it seems to be this hierarchy of courts. Just as the Parisian Bet Din's decision were considered to be more important than that of London, so in England, the Bet Din in York was considered to be more authoritative than that of Norwich, for example. And what we also find from the end of the 12th century is a fascinating position known as the Presbyter Omnium Judeorum, or Arch Presbyter, almost like a chief rabbi of England. The task of the Arch Presbyter was to provide a link between Crown officials and all the different Jewish communities. It became an office that the Jewish community is sometimes filled by common election and was usually held for life. The last arch presbyter, Hagin, son of Delicos, was appointed in May 1281. Rabbi Hagin was a London Jew who lived in Milk Street, and this was in the parish of Mary Magdalene. And it seems that Hagin tended to favor the government and was clearly not trusted by the Jews that he represented. In 1275, he was actually excommunicated by the Jewish community for refusing to stand trial before the Bet Din. He is not mentioned among the Jewish deportees and therefore is presumed to have died before the expulsion. Also a sign for us that things didn't always run smoothly with this chief um, official. What languages are the Jews speaking at this time? Well, French was the language of the Jewish hearth and home in post-conquest England, and seems to have remained so right up until their expulsion. No doubt, most Jews did learn to speak some English. They must have done so simply to carry on their daily lives and business dealings. But English never seems to have become their primary vernacular language. Jews continue to bear French names, usually translations of the meaning of their Hebrew names. And let's see this in actual fact. Hagen, son of Delacroix. What does the word Delacroix mean? If we may turn it into Latin, of course we have Dium Ium Crescit, God increases him, which again can easily be turned into the Hebrew, which is Gedalia at the bottom. Interestingly enough, by the 1260s, there are only two groups of people in England whose children are still being raised in French. One was the Jews, and the other was the royal family in England. Hebrew was obviously used for the Jews' ritual and prayer. And in terms of socioeconomics, what does the Jewish community look like at this time? Well, not surprisingly, from everything we've said so far, we've got this stratum of very rich, influential men of business at the top. And then we have a majority of comparatively wealthy Jews in the larger middle uh, social grouping. And then a few poorer Jews at the lower end who might have been servants, but certainly would have found jobs within the community, either in the food or in trade um, as such. 
In terms of professions then, we are looking without doubt at mostly money lenders. Jews gain an edge in money lending because they are allowed to travel from county to county to visit fairs in order to ply their trade. Christian money lenders were only allowed to work in their own county. This means, of course, that Jews have the upper hand. They can seek out the best deals to foreign merchants at different fairs who had to exchange their coins for more expensive English ones. And in many cases, Jews would have engaged in money lending or pawnbroking alongside another occupation. Female Jewish participation in money lending is extensively documented and it appears that Jewish women play this active role in their family's economic endeavors, continuing to do so even after they were widowed. Some Jews we know even became involved in the tin business in the West Country. And what we know also is that Jews were doctors, they were teachers, they were scribes, they were bakers, they were butchers, traders, really servicing their own communities as well. A few other important facts. Demographers now believe that Jewish families in England were no larger and conceivably smaller than those of their Christian neighbors. And it seems that Jews and Jewesses had a life expectancy of about 40 years. Jewish females seem to have lived considerably longer than Christian females whose skeletons were studied at York Jewbury Cemetery in 1982. And as you can see, the cemetery is actually underneath the car park in York, but there is um, a sign to show that this was the location of the medieval Jewish cemetery. And around a, a thousand burials were uncovered in York. 500 of them were then reinterred, and this plaque was placed in their memory and the other burials were left undisturbed in 1982. We know that Jews ate a lot of fish and now with archaeological evidence are convinced that the Jews of Oxford were very strict in observing their kosher and keeping uh, kashrut and, and eating kosher. A few small facts about halakhic or legal rulings that are spe specific to England. Well, Jacob Chazan's Sefer Etzchayim that I've mentioned already leniently permits Jews to share a beer with Christians in their houses. But I want to take this a little further. It seems that medieval England produced very little local wine and the Jewish community was too small either to produce its own or to import it from France with any regularity. And most of the year they got by by drinking beer. But let us remember that beer is forbidden on the festival of Passover, just like bread. And the Passover seder requires that each participant consume four cups of wine. Moses of London, the rabbi Moses of London, composed instructions for Jews celebrating the seder without wine, and versions of this list were included in the Eitz Chaim and in Tosafot Chachamei Anglia. Now, what about cemeteries? Well, in regard to cemeteries, from 1177, provincial juries were allowed to set up their own cemeteries, so they didn't have to bring bodies to be buried in the Jewish cemetery um, in London. And that's really, you know, a, a good change for them. And even in Oxford, if you think about it, what is known today as the Dead Man's Walk was actually the root of medieval Jewish funeral processions. A procession would begin at the synagogue where Tom Tower now stands and proceed towards what is now the Botanical Gardens where the medieval Jewish cemetery was situated. And these cemeteries were built at that time obviously outside the city walls. So that's Jewish life. But now let's turn to Aaron of Lincoln. It's always good to home in and to see one particular figure and how um, his life plays out. Now, of all the most successful 
late 12th century Jewish moneylenders, the most prominent was Aaron of Lincoln. And it was his funds that provided the loan to build Lincoln Cathedral. The list of those to whom he lent is striking. It includes the King of Scotland, as you can see here. It includes counts, earls, archbishops, bishops, abbots, and towns, confirming that his business was carried out on a local as well as a national level. And the list of Aaron's debtors clearly proves, I think, that a successful Jewish businessman or his agents had to be well-traveled, well-informed, and well aware of the different types of securities offered for each loan, as well as to be able to deal with a wide spectrum of different Christian clientele. Aaron's financial activities, including buying the debts of other Jews, lending both large and small sums, securing rent charges, pawnbroking, and even speculating in cereal crops. And in establishing his financial empire, Aaron had many employees, a network of agents, both members of his own family and other Jews, to manage the far-flung geographical spread of his dealings. And indeed, the Jews were almost ahead of their time in providing the wherewithal for credit to drive an economy forward. But then what happened when a great moneylender died? Well, Aaron's death in 1186 was a misfortune for the Jewish community at large. The king had a right to at least a third of all Jewish estates, but in this instance, King John took the whole estate. The sums involved were prodigious. Aaron may have owed, been owed as much as 75,000 pounds in principal and interest on his bonds. To collect these debts, a special office, the Scassarium Aronis, and was established in the royal exchequer with responsibility for tracking down and collecting the sums due to the deceased Jew. This exchequer of the Jews in Westminster would be maintained as a dedicated ever vigilant government machinery from 1189 when Aaron died until the Jews' expulsion in 1290. We should also, unfortunately, be making a connection in our minds between King John's attempts to collect these, death, these debts after Aaron's death and the massacre of the Jews in York in 1190, because the massacre occurs four years after Aaron's death, which I'm going to talk about in a few moments. All of Aaron's debtors were summoned to account with the king at different centres such as Nottingham, Northampton and Oxford. The royal officials were tenacious in pursuit of the king's rights and tried many ploys to collect this windfall. Finally, 22 years after Aaron's death in 1208, his son Elias agreed to pay a lump sum of 133 pounds, six shillings and eight pence for bonds worth 400 pounds, which were neither the worst nor the best debts from Aaron's estates. Another result of this royal interest in Jewish loaning activities was the creation in 1194 of what's known as an, an Arca system. An Arca, of course, being a box or an ark which now demanded that all transactions, monetary transactions, lending between Jews and Christians had to be written down and recorded in a series of arcs or chests. And in each town, there were at least two Christians and two Jew Jewish chirographers, those responsible for collecting fines and placing them in the arca or box. And so in many ways, I think, Aaron has set up a standard for later Jews. And the kings soon realized that they did not merely have to borrow from their Jew Jewish subjects, but they could just as easily tax the Jews to supply some of their needs. 
And noting, I think, this change in atmosphere, I wanted to show you this scribal cartoon. Here we see in 1233, Isaac Durrett of Norwich having three heads at the top. He is the main moneylender. The other man that you see here with the, with, um, to which the devil is pointing his nose is Moses Mock, his debt collector, who Moses Mock has this Jewish hat that we've mentioned before, the Cornutium Pilium, a spiked hat which becomes a sign of a Jew in Christian art. And we see in this picture as well sort of this manipulation of Jews by devils, particularly on the right-hand side, and demons um, moving towards. So definitely a deterioration again in depictions of Jews. So unfortunately, uh, we need now to turn to anti-Judaism in England at this time. And of course, we need to mention the famous massacre at Clifford's Tower um, in York in 1190. And unfortunately, I think, as in most European countries, under Christian leaders in particular, we come to a point where we need to start talking about anti-Judaism. In England, the situation got worse in the 12th century, thanks really to the impact of the Dominicans and Franciscans, who bring with them this new mission and message of conversion. Both orders had papal backing, and their members attended and infiltrated dominant positions in the universities. Here we see them speaking at public places, and that really was their thing, you know, to speak, to, 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 to stand outside in the main squares, and to start giving a sermon to show the local Christians how they should behave, and to warn them about separating from local Jews. Both the Franciscans and the Dominicans were geared to conversion and proselytizing, and both spread quickly within the towns or near Jewish neighborhoods with the intention of bringing the Christian message to Jewish audiences. These were orders that fired allegations of ritual murder against Jews. The one in Lincoln at the bottom of this list was particularly harsh where 18 Jews were actually executed when they were accused of killing this small Christian boy, Hugh of Lincoln. By the way, if you want to go and visit Hugh of Lincoln, where he was actually buried, this is, um, this is his tomb inside Lincoln Cathedral. Um, I've had the pleasure of standing there. Um, and there is now actually a plaque next to it, which shows a lot of sort of uh, tolerance and uh, apology for this treatment, for this accusation of the Jews. It's interesting, I think at the end of the 17th century, the tomb was actually opened and the body was, was, um, was studied. And it was clear that the body of the boy who is inside this, uh, of the child um, inside this tomb was not um, at all tortured or, um, or attacked as some of the suggestions are made as to what Jews did a Christian, against Christian children at this time. So remember also, by this time, we are also living through a period of crusading history. And I would argue that anti-Judaism was inspired by this whole ideology as well. The papacy promises crusaders forgiveness of sin to any Christian who took a crusading vow to travel to Jerusalem and become a warrior of Christ. And such an incentive took the form of the church declaring this moratorium, this postponement of paying the Jews their debts. And this, of course, brought direct help to crusaders and their families, but complicated by far the life of the Jews. And to this pattern, the Great York Massacre was clearly no exception. But I think it owes its enduring fame as the locus classicus of medieval English anti-Judaism in England to three real features. The first is this remarkable savagery with which the persecution at York was conducted. Secondly, the unusual details in which it was recorded by contemporary chroniclers. And William of Newburgh's allegation that the massacre was the product not only of misguided religious zeal, but also of a calculated conspiracy on the part of impoverished local notables intent on liquidating their debts to the Jews by force. 
So how come we know so much about this massacre in York? Well, we have three reliable sources. The first is William of Newburgh, a, an Augustian, Augustinian canon and 12th century English historian. We have Roger of Howden, who was a 12th century chronicler. And we have Rabbi Ephraim of, of Bonn, also known as Ephraim Ben Yaakov. He's an Ashkenazic Talmudist. We're not sure where he lived, but he was also a writer who produced discordant descriptions of the tragedy. And let's look a little bit closer at the details of this case. Well, the situation had started with the coronation of King Richard the Lionheart in September 1189. Prominent Jews had decided to attend his coronation, which was interpreted by the nobles and barons as an affront. A Jew should not be attending a coronation. And many of these Jews were attacked as a result. The main moneylender of York at the time, Benedict, was severely wounded and he died on his way home in Northampton. The attack on Jewish moneylenders created much rioting and rioters in York, knowing of Benedict's death, entered Benedict's house in York, killed his widow and children, set the roof on fire ablaze and carried off the treasures that they found there. And these Christian men saw the riots as an opportunity to wipe out their extensive debts that they owed Jewish moneylenders. These Jews probably lived in Jabbergate in York. The name is derived from the addition of a Middle English prefix, Jew, as in here, J-U, implying that here was the property held by Benedict of York and other Jewish families. The next day, the York Jews, under the leadership of Benedict's colleague, Josse, also a moneylender, took the natural step of seeking protection from the royal constable of York's castle. As in, the Jews are frightened. They're going to run to the castle. Note that by this time, which was the 14th of March, it was nearly Easter and Passover, a time of tension between Jews and Christians, Christians reenact the final hours of Jesus' death. And this is a time when Jews are nervous. The king was away, as he was for most of his reign. And his absence in northern France throughout this time was guaranteed, I think, to produce an emotionally charged and inflammatory situation. All but a few members of the Jewish community of York were, in fact, firmly entrenched inside the castle walls. Securely ensconced in the keep of the castle, but nervously anticipating treachery on the part of its royal constable, the Jews decide not to readmit the royal constable. The royal constable, his name was William Longchamp, appeals to help to John Marshall, the sheriff of Yorkshire, who happened, perhaps almost not in, uh, coincidentally, to be in the vicinity with a large force of county soldiers. And it was apparently John Marshall's impetuous decision to eject the Jews from the castle by force. As William of Newburgh, one of our chroniclers, makes clear, the sheriff's orders to besiege the castle deluded as he said, all the workers and young men in the town, as well as a large crowd of countrymen and many military men believed that an onslaught of the Jews had, would have royal approval. By the time the sheriff had rescinded his order, it was too late. The mob clustered around the foot of the castle keep and was in the grip of a religious frenzy and a ready prey to hysterical ravings of a maverick, a white-robed hermit from a pre monstratensian canonry, a religious order that had been found in 1120 in France. This hermit was actually crushed by a stone rolling down from the wall, was, and he was the only Christian casualty throughout the entire siege. And according to William of Nuba, the Jews were able to defend themselves successfully for several days, 
I think a tribute not only to the courage they found in desperation, but also to the impregnability of the late 12th century castle. Only when the specially prepared siege machines were finally moved into position on Friday the 16th of March, did it become obvious to Christian and Jews alike that, quote, the fatal hour was imminent. And it was that evening, the 16th of March, two days before Palm Sunday and on the eve of Shabbat Haggadol, the great Shabbat before the Passover festival, therefore a Friday night, that the tragic denouement occurred. And Rabbi Yom Tov of Joini, the spiritual leader of the Jewish community in York, the famous doctor of law, called on his co-religionists to anticipate that certain death in the Hebrew, in the heroic fashion, hallowed by Hebrew tradition, that of Kiddush, Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of God's name, the same type of dying that had been recorded in Hebrew crusading chronicles 50 years earlier. And Rabbi Ephraim of Bonn notes that all are agreed that a cons very considerable number of Jews did decide to carry out Yom Tov's proposal. The terrible responsibility for killing the women and children then seems to have fallen to the fathers of each Jewish household in turn. And we think that approximately 150 Jews lost their lives. This mass self-destruction took place in the accompaniment of a raging fire, probably started by the instructions of Rabbi Yom Tov, which consumed the valuables and bodies of many of the victims, imperiling the lives of the survivors. And the epilogue was almost as dramatic and even more horrifying. At daybreak on the following morning, William of Newburgh tells us, wretched remnants of the Jews appealed for mercy, so obviously not all of them killed themselves, in return for Christian baptism. But as they left the castle under a calculatedly insincere promise of clemency, the cruel brothers who followed Richard Malabis, he was in charge of the rioters, and the other leaders of the pogrom massacred them all. Immediately after the massacre, the conspirators made their way to York Minster, where they extracted from the terrified custodians the Jewish bonds deposited there in the arcade, in the boxes, in the chests and burned them in the middle of the church. It seems clear that there was no formal trial that did take place. And writing seven or eight years later, William of Nuba noted that no one has yet been brought to punishment for the slaughter of the York Jews. The massacre of the York Jews in 1190 was at least a, pr a part, a product, I think, of a rebellion by the Jews' debtors. And just a little after note, um, and if you go and visit there at the moment, the extant tower that you see was not the same structure where this suicide happens. This was actually built afterwards, um, and, and it was built after the fire that I described, and was probably used as a treasury and later inscription. But the Hebrew Bible that you, sorry, the Hebrew inscription that you see at the bottom of the hill um, is actually a quote also from Isaiah, which sort of em evoking medieval Jewish descriptions of written by using the Hebrew term, the isles or the islands of the sea. Also important note that the Jewish finances not only returned to York within a few years of the massacre, but did so under vigilant supervision of an English government determined and able to ensure that such a disaster would never happen again on English soil. But pressure unfortunately continues, particularly from the mendicant orders, the Franciscans and Dominicans. And one of the biggest contributions of the mendicant orders to anti-Judaism was their establishment in 1232 of a domus conversorum, a home for converts from Judaism to Christianity, a protective place, almost a sanctuary. The Jews who wanted to convert to Christianity could go to in order not to be hassled by other Jews who might try to prevent them. This was established under Henry III in London in January 1232, as I said, on the site of the present public records office in Chancery Lane. It was also the site of a former synagogue. 
And we think that between 1240 and 1260, as many as 10% of the English Jewish population might have converted, that's about 300 Jews out of 3,000 present in England in 1240. After 1280, Jews throughout England are compelled to attend to weekly conversion sermons that are preached by the Dominicans. And here you can see another Domus Conversorum in Oxford. And so we must move forward to the time of the expulsion of the Jews. King Edward I's stature of Jewry in 1275 put an end to Jewish involvement in the profession of money lending and appears to anticipate the expulsion of the Jews in 1290. The impact that Jews can no longer be money lenders was enormous with some Jews attempting to evade the new legislation and maintain their prior business activities and others seeking to find legitimate economic outlets on, or on occasions turning to crime. And particularly noteworthy in the wake of the 1275 legislation are the repeated accusations of Jewish coin clipping, the recurrent prosecution of suspected Jewish coin clippers, clipping off the sides of the, the, um, of the coins in particular, and as a result of this, harsh penalties were imposed. And Jewish business affairs in decline in any case were disastrously affected by this legislation of 1275. And this meant, of course, that the potential Jewish contribution to the royal coffers, already minimal, was now nearly non-existent. In 1276, the desperate Jews petitioned the king to let them serve him as of old. They tried to impress upon him the provisions in the statute concerning outstanding debts, grossly disadvantaged Jewish creditors in favor of Christian debtors. But their pleas fell on deaf ears, and it appears that Jews start to trickle out of England. Christians began to rely on the members of Italian banker, banking houses, which were beginning to enter the English financial world in the late 13th century. And so we have to come to the Jews' expulsion. Why are the Jews expelled in 1290? Well, recent interpretations have tended to concentrate on non-political, more abstract considerations like the growth of religious intolerance in both England and Western Europe as a whole, the impact of clerical and especially Dominican ideological pressures, and finally, in the mind of King Edward I. And of course, there is this stark reality about the Jews' presence in England at this time, which is that its raison d'etre, its raison d'etre had depended on a form of Jewish service which was at odds with ecclesiastical ideas concerning the correct position of Jews in Christian society. Money was considered dirty. You see this in Christian art, Pick depictions of side profile Jews working in money lending facilities. It's a negative connotation. The ideal in Christianity is the monk who gives up all of his possessions in particular. I want to suggest three reasons why I think the Jews were expelled from England. First of all, the growth of religious intolerance. Second of all, I think a policy that's particular to King Edward, King Edward, who wants the Jews to leave. And finally, the fact that the impoverished Jews really had nothing left to offer. We don't have a copy of the expulsion decree as we do for Sicily, as we do for Spain and Portugal. But on July the 18th, 1290, King Edward I announces that all Jews must leave England by the following, November the 1st, or convert to Christianity. And this is what he says. Whereas in the third year of our reign, we moved by solicitude for the honor of God and the well-being of the people of our realm, did ordain and decree that no Jew should henceforth lend to any Christian at usury upon security of lands, rent, or aught else, but that they should live by their own commerce and labor, 
And that's referring, of course, to 1275, the ruling that Jews could no longer be moneylenders. And whereas the said Jews did thereafter wickedly conspire and contrive a new species of us usury, more pernicious than the old, for which cause we, in requital of their crimes and for the honour of the crucified, have banished them from our realm as traitors. And look at this word, tamquam perfidos, to denote Jewish treachery echoes, I think, this theological use of the word, which often implied, according to Christian theologians, that there was something menacing, perfidy, about the Jewish lack of faith in Jesus Christ. It is most likely that the royal circle surrounding the king had been considering this move for a long time. By 1290, the Jewish population had dropped to less than 2,000, while the Christian population may have grown to as much as 6 million. But remember that 1066 to 1290 is only a Jewish presence of 224 years. There can only have been seven or eight generations of Jews who could claim to have actually have been born in medieval England. In 1290, the Jews face a stark choice between forced migration and conversion. Some chose the latter, most, cho most the former. And the whole process of the Jews leaving takes about four and a half months. The sheriffs are responsible for organizing a safe conduct and passage for the Jews at their own cost towards London, to move towards London and then uh, to cross the sea. Before they left, the Jews were to restore all pledges that Christians had lodged with them. But in fact, what we know now is that Edward himself does not make much money from the expulsion. Unlike his grandfather, King John, who had retrospectively tried to collect the debts of Aaron of Lincoln, Edward never presses for his Jewish debts, but merely records them. Yet Edward was still anxious to have a complete report of what the Jews had left behind. Now, where did Jews go? Well, the Jews expelled from England made their way eastward into royal France, where they added, I think, further strains on this already endangered community, and where the example of their expulsion would influence the larger and more far-reaching banishment from royal France in 1306. Others went to Netherlands, as you can see from the map, and some as far as Poland. Mayor Ben Elijah of Norwich, a 13th century poet, writes a representation of the account of the 1290 expulsion of English Jewry in his Piut, Oyeve Bemira Tekev, put a curse on my enemy, which expresses this hostility and injustice towards the Jews. So 1290 is an important break in the history of Jews in England. But what happens later? Well, Jews come back slowly. And I want to end with a few reflections, if I may, on the Jews' return. In comparison to what we've seen today of a harsh anti-Judaism coming from the Roman Catholic Church, when the Jews return to England, it is a Protestant country. We know that there were Spanish and Portuguese Jews in England during the colorful reign of Henry VIII from 1509 to 1547. During the interregnum, after the execution of the absolutist Charles I and before the reign of Charles II, England is ruled by the Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell between 1653 and 1658. Efforts are made particularly by the famous Amsterdam rabbi Menashe Ben Israel, the scholar, the mystic, the communal rabbi, of the Sephardi Jews in Amsterdam to try and to bring about the Jews' formal readmission. But the 1290 expulsion decree is never revoked and there is a mystery. And what happened in that Whitehall conference in 1655 when the Jews were supposed to be formally re-accepted by Oliver Cromwell? Did Cromwell give oral permission for the Jews to return? Are there, as Cecil Roth argued in 1962, pages missing from the minute book of the Whitehall Conference? Perhaps we should also note that once the Jews return, 
I would even argue that their history from then till today, till the 21st century, bears little resemblance to the history of Jews in other European states. It lacks the familiar episodes, the movements around which Jewish historians routinely structure their accounts of emancipation and modern history. Instead, in England, Jewish history marches to its own drummer, out of step, it would seem, with the experience of other European juries. Here, there is an absence of violence and turmoil. Perhaps the English had learned how to treat their Jews better than they had in 1066 and all that. It is almost as if there had been enough drama in the 224 years of the medieval Jewish moneylenders' experience in England. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Kathy. That was um, pretty well, I think. Uh, that was fascinating and interesting. And it seems like there's lots and lots of questions and comments from our audience. So I apologize, but I'm going to have to uh, choose a few. Um, what, who took over as money lenders after the Jews stopped um, being in that role? I, I did actually mention it, but maybe I didn't make that clear enough. Someone, really, Italian bankers come in, and they're very good at it. I mean, we see them doing it in Italy as well. And the story of moneylenders and, and, and Jews, uh, uh, Italian moneylenders and Jews in Italy is also sort of an interesting contrast. But once the Jews really leave England, the, the Italians come in and take, take advantage of that. They're, they're naturally good at it, and they, and, and they come in and open up banking houses there. Uh, but this Andrea is, this Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you, you can finish, sorry. No, I, th I mean, this is a stage that happens particularly at this time. I think that the English get a little better and more sophisticated as, as, as time moves on. But the Italians definitely take advantage of this moment when the, when the, when the Jews leave in 1290. Um, Bauch wants to know if the king was so strong in order for the decree to actually happen. Yeah, absolutely. I, without doubt, the king is demanding that the Jews leave. We actually know this rather sort of, I, I didn't, didn't mention it, but there's an event that happens pretty much prior on the, on the eve of the expulsion where the king goes through this fall when he's actually in Gascony. And he's convinced that he, he, it was a, a huge fall. He falls out of his, um, from a balcony down onto the ground and everybody thinks he's dead and he's not. And he believes that this is some sort of religious significance there that he needs to thank God in a way. And there are some scholars who say, well, this is, this is what Im, Im sort of impelled him to believe that he had to get rid of the Jews because this was an, a note from God that he had to do something to thank God that he was still alive and, and linked it to that. I think without doubt, the king is always going to have the power to decide what to do with, with the Jews. Remember, they're his serfs. He is in charge of when he wants to tax them and exactly how he wants to protect them. So if he's in that relationship with them anyway, he's always going to be the one that can demand that they be expelled. And that's what happens. And again, remember what it sets off in England. It's the first time the Jews of Europe are going to be expelled. 1290 is the first time. It triggers other kings to think in the same way. This is not what we want. We shouldn't be having Jews among us. Um, and, this, and this, as we know, will lead eventually to uh, you know, the most famous expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal, uh, first in, in, uh, in 1492 in Spain. And as we talked about last time, in Sicily in 1493. Right. 